The horror film figurehead William Castle once argued that the merits of the horror genre lay in its existence as an outlet for the public's imagination. But what happens when the public's imagination shifts? Are the icons of our fears replaced, or do they become something more terrifying? Do they disappear from the screen forever, or do they return in new forms? Do they come back to crawl deeper into your mind, or deeper into your wallet? Since film became a popular medium, adaptation has been a common practice across all genres. Romantic novels have become romantic comedies, pulp detective fiction has manifested itself in film noir, and comic books have inspired a whole slew of silver screen adventures, costumed and non-costumed alike. There is even the elusive film to musical to musical film adaptation. The horror adaptation is unique in regards to the rates at which the central subjects are made and revisited. Consider this. The first major figure of the horror genre was Quasimodo from Victor Hugo's novel The Hunchback of Notre Dame, as depicted in Alice Guy's 10-minute short film Esmeralda in 1905. Five years later, Thomas Edison produced the first Frankenstein movie, and 20 years after that, Frankenstein had become a Hollywood staple. In the 1930s, Universal, under the leadership of Carl Lamely Jr., had created an institution out of characters, or rather, archetypes based on romantic novels and other literature, such as The Invisible Man, The Raven, Dracula, and Frankenstein. Often in these productions, the Frankenstein monster was depicted as a shambling homunculus, a larger-than-life zombie. Dracula was shown as the ultimate manifestation of the other, a force of evil defined by foreignness. These characters proliferated across Hollywood, cropping up in sequels, rip-offs, and parodies. Film historian Paul O'Flynn raises this point regarding the nature of Mary Shelley's golem. There is no such thing as Frankenstein. There are only Frankensteins, as the text is ceaselessly rewritten, reproduced, refilmed, and redesigned. Thirty years later, a British production company known as Hammer famously took Langley Jr.'s horror icons and invoked a new sense of relevance into them. Peter Hutchings writes in his book Hammer and Beyond, the attitude adopted towards these particular characters is never fixed, but on the contrary, is constantly being modulated and reworked in relation to changes going on both within the genre and in society in general. Consider this clip from Universal's Dracula starring Bela Lugosi. Now this one from Count Dracula starring Christopher Lee. Notice how in the former Lugosi is depicted as this grand imposing presence from high up on the stairs, whereas Lee is depicted as an equal to Fred Williams' Jonathan Hawker. Decisions like these were made not for lack of budget, but rather to make the film scarier for the audience at the time. In the late 70s and 80s, remakes took on a different tone. Kim Newman explains in his book Nightmare Movies that instead of reappropriating the classic monsters, studios widely decided to focus on expensive, colorful remakes of cheap, mainly black and white 1950s greats. These included, but were not limited to, The Thing, The Fly, The Blob, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. John Carpenter's remake of The Thing is unique among these in the way that it approaches the original film. Rather than utilizing the Howard Hawks produced The Thing from Another World as source material, Carpenter goes back to the John W. Campbell short story, Who Goes There, that the Hawks film was loosely based on. Because Carpenter was creating his film in a decade without the restrictions of the Hayes Code, his film was able to achieve a more accurate, grisly adaptation of the original work. It is also worth pointing out that The Thing from Another World was intended as a reactionary film to the developing Cold War, a film that depicted citizens banding together to defend themselves from a vampire vegetable biped, and ultimately sending out a cautious, didactic message to watch the skies. Carpenter's film also deals with the Cold War subtext, though his film has a grimmer outlook, instead choosing the focus on the paranoia the conflict caused. The Thing presents a situation where no one can trust each other, and the person being helped may just be the enemy. In 2010, audiences clamored over a Nightmare on Elm Street film that was viewed as both a cash grab for studio platinum dunes and an effort to humanize the Freddy Krueger character. In 2004, Zack Snyder released a remake of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, which infamously introduced the idea of the fast zombie to the zombie subgenre. Another trend to arise from this decade has been the remake of the foreign horror film, often with only two or three years between releases. So why keep making these movies over and over again? Why revisit old content so frequently? Perhaps it is because we can sympathize with the vampires in the Voorhees clan. Perhaps we need something familiar to project our fears on, even as our fears change. Perhaps that change is what keeps us surrounded by the same monsters.